2121. Glenn is involved in a complicated case that includes a multidisciplinary team of professionals. The team includes parents, teachers, and other therapists who all have a responsibility to the client. What must Glenn do in this situation? By now, we should start picking up on these key words that are used time and time again on our exam. Things like multidisciplinary team, responsibility, and what must we do? When we talk about multidisciplinary teams, we're talking about collaboration. When we're talking about a responsibility to the client, we're talking about ethics. You need to start piecing this stuff together as we're reading the question because it's going to make answering the question easier. So what is the question asking? The question is asking, what must Glenn do in this situation? What is the situation? He's on a complicated case. He's collaborating with a team of professionals, and they all have a responsibility to the client. What is Glenn's role here? A, take a leadership role on the team, and I'll have all stakeholders report to him. Are BCBAs the leader on every single collaborative team they're on? No, okay? It really depends. If you're on a school team, chances are you won't be the leader on that team. Now, if you're on a clinical team operating out of your ABA clinic, that might be different. But you can't assume you're taking a leadership role on every single collaboration you might come across. So A is wrong. B, identify his role and responsibility to each stakeholder. Yes, this is ripped straight from our ethics, straight from our task list. When we collaborate, we need to identify our role as the behavior analyst and what is our responsibility to each stakeholder. What is our responsibility to the parents, the clients, the teachers, and everybody else on our team? Are we sharing information? Are we working for them? Are we working with them? Where do we stand? If we do B, if we identify our role, it's going to make collaboration a lot smoother. We're going to remove some of the tension, some of maybe the conflict, and we can go back to what we're supposed to be doing, which is focusing on the client. B is better than A. What about C? Receive further training on conducting behavior analysis in schools. Well, maybe we should always continue our education, right? But in this case, we're not talking about further training. We're just talking about how do we handle ourselves on a multidisciplinary collaborative team? And this is where the, tr the test can get tricky because you might say, well, further training on behavior analysis in schools might be relevant here, right? But the word school is never mentioned, okay? We talk about teachers, but not necessarily schools. So we need to be really careful, okay? C is just not applicable. And then D, evaluate the teacher's plan and make necessary changes. No, the teacher's going to have their own plan, just like we have our plan, okay? What we can do is offer to take data. But we shouldn't go in and start correcting everybody's plan or treatment based on what we believe, right? We're there to collaborate. They really, really stress collaboration on the fifth edition task list and on the new ethical code. So 121, what must Glenn do? B, identify his role and responsibility to each stakeholder. 122, Halloween is Lurch's favorite holiday of the year. He drives to his friend's neighborhood because they have the best trick-or-treating in town. Lurch knows to go to the houses with the lights on and not off because those houses will surely provide him and his friends candy. Lurch is engaging in what? Pretty straightforward question. Lurch is engaging in what? Well, what is Lurch doing? He drives to his friend's neighborhood for trick-or-treating. He knows what? He knows to go to the houses with the lights on and not off. What must Lurch do to identify houses that have lights on and light houses that have lights off? Does he need to differentiate? Well, be careful. What is the difference between differentiation and discrimination? Differentiation, we're dealing with multiple responses. Lurch is engaging in the same response here, right? He's, he's trick-or-treating to the houses. What he's doing, though, is discriminating between stimuli. One house has lights on, one house has lights off. Two different stimuli, Lurch has to discriminate between, okay, to identify what house to go to. That's how you need to remember differentiation versus discrimination. Differentiation is dealing with responses and multiple responses. Discrimination is dealing with stimuli or stimulus and multiple stimuli. Lurch has to discriminate between houses with their lights on and off to choose what house to trick or treat at. Now, what about response generalization? Response generalization says we have multiple responses across a single stimuli. In this case, we only have one response, right? Going to the house, trick or treating. We're dealing with multiple stimuli here, lights on or lights off. So we're not generalizing a response here. And then D, response blocking. Nobody's blocking Lurch's response. D is irrelevant. Lurch is really discriminating between the houses who have their lights on and who have their lights 
off? Pretty straightforward question. 123, a behavior analyst is hired to help a professional baseball player improve his performance. The professional baseball player also has a spiritual advisor, a sports psychologist, and a hitting coach on his team. The spiritual advisor tells the baseball player that the best thing to do to improve his performance is meditate 20 minutes each day. This will reduce stress and anxiety. What is the behavior analyst's responsibility in this situation? First things first, long, wordy questions. Understand the question first before you even read the answer choices. Don't speed through the question here and jump to the answer choices. You're going to end up having to go back and reread it anyway. Do all your work up front on 123, and then we get to the answer choices. So what is happening in this question? Well, it's another collaboration question. Again, the ethical code in the fifth edition really stressed collaboration. We have a multidisciplinary team full of spiritual advisors, sports psychologists, and hitting coaches. Okay, We are coming on as a behavior analyst to help not only the professional baseball player, but to be a part of this team. So we now must answer another question on collaboration and teamwork. In this case, what is happening? Well, we have a spiritual advisor telling the baseball player that the best thing to do to improve performance is meditate because it will reduce stress and anxiety. Is that behavior analytic in nature? No, we are not going to focus on reducing stress and anxiety. Regardless of how you feel about meditation as a behavior analytic practice, we are not going to focus on stress and anxiety. These are not observable. These are not measurable. So if we're on this team and the advisor wants to implement this intervention, what do we do? What is our responsibility? A, refuse to participate in any non-behavior analytic work. Well, no, you can certainly be a part of the team. We shouldn't just say, well, you're not doing behavior analytic work. I'm not helping out. Because what if this is actually benefiting the player? We might be doing a disservice to our client. You should not refuse to participate. Okay. Now, if you're going to participate, you need to participate in ways that behavior analysts are trained in, taking data, delivering behavior analytic work, those type of things. However, A is wrong. B, receive additional training on spiritual advising and meditation. You are free to receive additional training on whatever you would like, but you still need to adhere to behavior analytic principles as long as you're acting as a behavior analyst. Spiritual advising is not going to be behavior analytic in nature. All right. So this is not your responsibility. You have the choice to do that, but it is certainly not your responsibility. C, take data on the baseball player's performance. Absolutely. Okay. Maybe we can't measure stress and anxiety. Maybe we aren't trained in spiritual advising. But if the spiritual advisor implements this meditation procedure, we can certainly take data before and after it happens. Okay. And then try to attribute it. Does the intervention work? Does it not? We can still be a part of the team even if we're not actively participating in this stress and anxiety intervention. C so far is the most collaborative in nature. And then D, explain to the spiritual advisor the difference between observable and non-observable events. No, we're not going to preach to the spiritual advisor on how he should do his job. We need to worry about our job. So C is going to be the most collaborative and most teamwork in nature. 124. What is meant by steady state responding? Very straightforward question, not here to trick you. We just need to know what is steady state responding. What does steady state responding refer to? Steady state responding typically re refers to baseline. When we're taking baseline, what are we looking for? We're looking for consistent data because if we're trying to decrease a behavior, if our baseline is decreasing, are we going to need, need an intervention? Not necessarily. What about if we're trying to increase a behavior and it's already increasing? Again, we're not necessarily going to need an intervention. What we're looking for is steady responding in one way, right? Maybe steady responding upwards, steady responding downwards, even flat, okay? We want our responding to be steady in baseline. So A, when a client answers several questions in a row correctly, no. B, when a client responds rapidly to given SDs, again, no steady state responding has to do with baseline. C, when baseline data lacks variability. Yes, that's what we're looking for. We want our baseline, okay, to lack variability. Because if our baseline is variable, it's going to be difficult to determine, do we actually need to intervene on this behavior? And then D, when behavior momentum is achieved. Again, no steady state responding. We were talking about baseline data lacking variability. 125, staff training and supervision should be behavior analytic in nature. 
when training staff on new procedures that the staff have not implemented before, what should be one of the first things accomplished? What should be one of the first things we do when starting training? Here's the secret. When the exam or when the study guide or whenever you're studying and we talk about staff training and supervising staff, that kind of thing, it's no different than working with the client. Everything we're doing is behavior analytic in nature. So if we're training a staff, it's going to be very similar to how we train clients. What do we do first when we want to train clients with something new? Do we outline training object objectives? Absolutely. We need goals. What are we trying to accomplish? First things first, what are we trying to accomplish? A is absolutely one of the first things we want to do. Now, can we find something even better? B, role play the intervention with the trainees. Well, before we role play, we'll, what do we need to do? We need to outline our objectives. C, model the intervention for the trainees. Before we model, okay, even before we role play, we model, but before we model, we outline, right? We're talking about one of the first things accomplished, and that is outline training objectives. And then D, taking data, data on staff's current implementation, that's going to be one of the last things. After we outline, after we model, after we role play, now we can take data on how the, does the staff actually implement what we train them on, okay? A is going to be our best answer. Again, when you talk about staff training, supervising trainees or supervisees or RBTs, training them, whatever it is, it's almost identical to teaching a client to do something. We use reinforcement, we use contingencies, we goals, model, et cetera, et cetera, okay? They're one and the same. 126, an indirect assessment identifies bad language in inappropriate situations as potential target behavior. Based on the following baseline data, how should the behavior analyst proceed? All right, so we have a data question, and we're looking at what kind of data? We're looking at baseline data. Let's look at our data. Day one, eight instances of bad language. Day two, eight instances of bad language. Day three, six. Day four, three. What do we notice about our data? Well, it's trending down. What do we just talk about with baseline? We want a steady state. Now, is this in a steady state? Sure, it lacks variability, right? It's trending down. However, what are we trying to do with bad language? Well, we want to reduce it, right? Bad language in inappropriate situations as a target behavior. Our baseline says this target behavior is actually already decreasing. What do we need to do in that situation? If you have a target behavior for decrease that's already decreasing or a target behavior for increase that's already increasing, how should we proceed? A, implement a differential reinforcement procedure with a replacement behavior targeting the bad language. Well, maybe not, right? We might not need to intervene at all. This behavior is slowly taking care of itself. There's maybe a chance that on, you know, before we took baseline, this client engaged in bad language, received a ton of attention, and temporarily started using a lot of bad language. But as the days passed, he received less and less attention, and it just kind of faded away, Okay. Nothing yet indicates we need to implement an intervention. B, design a punishment procedure due to the problematic nature of bad language. We certainly don't need a punishment procedure because this behavior is already decreasing, 8863. C, conduct a functional assessment to identify the function of the bad language. Hopefully, before you took baseline, you identified the function. D, continue taking baseline. Sure. Now, if there was an answer that says, no need to intervene, that's probably better than taking baseline, okay? Because the behavior is already decreasing. But if we want to gain more information and given the situation and the answer choices, D is going to be our best. Continue taking baseline, okay? If we flatline or we continue decreasing, no need for intervention. If we start to increase again, well, maybe that changes, okay? But at the, as it currently sits, there's no need to intervene, okay? Just continue taking your baseline data. 127. Antecedents and consequences are considered blank in relation to the behavior. So antecedents and consequences happen before and after behavior. They happen at a point in time in relation to the behavior. Now, depending on what the antecedent is, what the consequence is, it's going to have some sort of effect or non-effect on the behavior. But in general, what are antecedents and consequences considered when we're talking in relation to a specific behavior. Are they formal, functional, temporal, 
or topographical? Well, formal and topographical really describe how the antecedents and consequences look. And that's really specific to the antecedents and consequences themselves, not so much in relation to the behavior. Functional okay, is going to be how they uh, affect behavior, right? But in relation to the behavior, right, antecedents and consequences are temporal because no matter what they look like or what effect they have on the behavior, antecedents and consequences always come before and after behavior. They happen at a point in time, they are considered temporal. This type of behaviorism focused on the two-term contingency. Okay, our two-term contingency is pairing a stimulus to a response, right? Our three-term contingency, what we use today is a stimulus response, stimulus contingency. Today, we use radical behaviorism. That's what we're focused on, okay? We acknowledge private events as behavior, but we still just focus on observable, measurable, external events, public events, right? So what type of behaviorism focuses on the two-term contingency? That was methodological, okay? Because Watson, right, focused on the pairing of neutral stimuli, okay, with other stimuli to evoke a certain response. So B is our answer. 129. Hank is the chief financial officer at a Fortune 500 company. The CEO of the company asked Hank to create a manual outlining what he does day in and day out in case something were to ever happen to Hank. What dimension of applied behavior analysis is most important for Hank to focus on when writing his manual? All right, dimension questions. When answering dimension questions, you need to pick the most relevant dimension to the question being asked, right? Because with dimensions, multiple dimensions can play a part. So in this case, what is Hank trying to do? He's trying to write this manual outlining what he does day in and day out in case something happens to him. So what's the most important aspect of this manual? A, generality. Does it need to be generalized? Well, no, it doesn't matter, right? Hank's going to write this manual for his job. Okay, he's not going to write it to generalize to other jobs. Generality is not necessarily important. But what about analytic and applied? Does Hank want to write it in a valid way where, where the things inside the manual are socially valid, they're important? Sure. What about analytic? Does he want the manual to have an effect on the people reading it? And does he want, uh, does he want the task or the, the duties outlined to be behavioral and have a functional relation to what they're trying to accomplish? Sure. But above all that, right, what's most important? It needs to be replicable. Because no matter how applied or analytic it might be, if it's not technological, then nobody's going to be able to replicate it, right? So if Hank is in a car crash and he can't come and explain the manual to the person reading it, okay, none of the other stuff matters. It has to be technological. Just like our treatment plans need to be technological, replicable, repeatable, right? The most important dimension here is C, technological. Because above all else, Whoever reads that manual, okay, needs to be able to implement it and replicate it. And then 130, a behavior analyst conducts a series of interviews with a new client's team of stakeholders. The behavior analyst has never met the client, but obtains great information from the interviews. While conducting interviews, the behavior analyst assigns the RBT to collect data on the client. The following day, the analyst and the RBT get together and start designing a treatment plan for the client based on the interview and the data. Evaluate the scenario. Long question. A lot of words, a lot of information. Let's make sure we understand the question first. The question just says evaluate the scenario, right? So that's going to be a little harder to attack. We're not really sure how we're evaluating it yet. So let's go through it one more time and think about it. So we have a behavior analyst conducts a series of interviews with the new client's team. Okay, seems fine so far. The behavior analyst has never met the client but obtains great information from the interviews. Okay, indirect, it's fine. While conducting interviews, the behavior analyst assigns the RBT to collect data on the client. Okay, good. The following day, the analyst and the RBT get together and start designing a treatment plan for the client based on the interview and the data. Now, what is the issue here? Well, has the behavior analyst ever even observed the client? No. All, we, all the analyst has done is, is conducted an interview and then assigned an RBT to collect data. The analyst themselves has never done a direct observation. How can they possibly design an effective treatment plan using only an interview and secondhand data? They can't. 
they need to conduct a direct observation first. So let's evaluate this scenario. A, this scenario is sufficient in terms of designing a treatment plan. It is not, right? We're missing a critical direct observation. B, the analyst should directly observe the client before creating a treatment plan. Yes, this is what we're looking for. This is what is missing. C, the RVT should be involved in the indirect assessment. Not necessarily. They can be, they can't be. It's not a requirement. And then D, the RBT should not conduct a direct assessment by themselves. If you think about it, RBTs, all they do are direct assessments, right? They're constantly observing the client and taking data. So D is just wrong. What's missing here, everything else is right. What's missing is the analyst should directly observe the client before creating a treatment plan. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe. Check out bcbastudy.com for all of our study materials. Questions, comments, let me know. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.